All right, here we go. All right, so let's open with a word of prayer now that we're all together. Father, uh, we uh, we give praise to you uh, this evening and, and this morning in Africa. And uh, we ask your blessing on our time together. And we pray, Father, for your wisdom as we look at your word and uh, search the, the meaning that you would have for each of us today. We're talking about your church, Lord, and so we need your wisdom to understand and interpret uh, the scripture we're looking at. We give all the praise and glory to you, Father, and we thank you for everyone who's here uh, this evening. In Christ's name we pray, to your glory, amen. Okay, well, I... I uh, thought about entitling this section, The Church and Its Mission. And the more I got into it, I decided to call it The Church Age. And as we have done in on a couple of other subjects, once we got past inerrancy and, and God himself, uh, we've looked at Old Testament prophecy. And uh, as I indicated in the notes, uh, if you search any concordance like Strong's, which is as complete as you get, the word church is not in the Old Testament, but that's, of course, uh, dependent on the translations. There is the use of the word congregation. And um, uh, as I indicated in my notes, that's often the congregation of the, the nation of Israel. Um, but there are a lot of Old Testament prophecies which relate um, maybe indirectly, but they, they deal with uh, Christ, which we've already talked about those. And of course, we know when Christ was here, uh, or at least shortly after he left, the church became a real thing. Uh, when the Holy Spirit came. So uh, I referred you back to last week's uh, uh, references on the Old Testament. And I go on to note that there are a lot of prophecies that deal uh, without mentioning the church age, but they deal with the, with the current age, the church age that we're in. and uh, And also they deal with the with beyond uh, when when the church is in heaven and um, many of these are found in the book of Daniel and I picked uh, one verse from the book of Daniel uh, to start with which is Daniel 727 which says in the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. And by the way, I, I want to stop here a minute. Or shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. That, that verbiage in that, uh, in that verse, in effect says, we will, we will rule, that is the church will rule with, with Jesus in his kingdom and it's an ever then going on this verse says his kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him so the saints will be ruling with him but we will be obedient to him and serving him and that's daniel and um, there's a confirmation of this in the book of revelation Chapter 20, verse 4, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had be been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, 
Okay, so this deals, first of all, we note this deals with the millennium, so-called millennium. And it talks specifically about those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Christ, for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image. So those generally are thought of as people who um, committed that they were Christians and would not uh, accept the uh, Antichrist requirement of receiving the mark. Um, and so they gave their lives. Um, it doesn't look like it refers specifically to the church, but that's where you, if you go back up and look at, at the very first line, then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And different commentaries look at that differently. But if you look at it from the point of view of the earlier verse in Daniel, where we are uh, reigning with Christ, there are common commentaries that read this verse from Revelation to basically include the full church, including the, that is the, the pre-trib church, or now I'm getting into the prophecy part, but it's the, the church who are there in heaven, including those who were involved and lost their lives in the tribulation. And then you go down to the last line and it says, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So the collective they that I'm suggesting is the church plus those people who gave their lives during the tribulation in the event they're two separate groups, depending on whether you're pre-trib or not. So that takes care of that thousand years. We did it in about five minutes. But let's take a let's take a look at the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verses three and four. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no lamp, light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light. And, and, and here's really the part that point I want to make. We a lot to talk about in what we've read, but then the last phrase and they will reign forever and ever. So that takes care of the church reigning with Christ beyond that millennium. Okay, any, any questions? This, the, the, the rest of that verse, or verses from chapter 22 in Revelation, uh, deal with what, what it will be like in heaven and we'll get into some of that in the next two weeks. An interesting Old Testament reference uh, to God's congregation is in Psalm 22. This is the David authored Psalm, and it's often called the Song of the Cross, as I noted in the notes. And it's all about Christ's suffering on the cross. Uh, this is not the not the psalm where he says, uh, where it is prophesied that he says it is finished, but he does have a plea to be rescued. And the psalm's next verse after that plea is, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And so here's, this is, uh, in, the, in Psalms, this is Christ speaking. He says, I will tell of your name, God, Father, to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. 
So here's a place where the word congregation can be interpreted perhaps as the church in the light of Old Testament prophecy. And this passage is referenced in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. He who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will, and here he quotes right from that psalm. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. So this business of searching out references to the church in the Old Testament, I have found to be um an education it's there there's a lot more there than uh what i have uh, printed to you i've noted you can search for other names for the church the bride of christ the assembly of the saints um uh adams you'll appreciate this but i i have this i think i've told all of you i have this weekly meeting with don smith via zoom don's in in uh, nairobi and i got talking to him about this subject and he said well rex you have to look at those that are chosen and in fact that's true uh, if you have a concordance Go to the word chosen, and wow, there are a ton of them. But a lot of them apply to things other than the people who are chosen. But if you, I, and I didn't put this in the notes because uh, the notes were out before I had my conversation with Dr. Don. But um, you might take a note, um, Psalm 33. 12 and uh, Psalm 33 12 says blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord the people whom he has chosen as his heritage so there's that word chosen and then from a, for a New Testament reference, I'm going to give you Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, I'm trying to get it here on my, my computer Bible. Chapter 1, verse 4. And uh, that verse reads, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. So it's, it's not a stick in your face kind of a clear tie between Old Testament prophecy and the church in the New Testament, but it's there okay we the church is god's chosen ones now don also made the comment to me that um often in the old testament the 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 authors guided by the spirit were uh, led to use um the word uh, were chosen and similar words to talk about the nation Israel. However, there, there are those who read some of these Old Testament saints writings to interpret uh, Israel in a broader sense. That is, once um, the uh, Gentiles 
have been brought in to the fold, uh, a, the nation Israel has the meaning of that word has a broader context. And I'm not going to get into that here, but um, there are uh, different interpretations placed on that by different believers. In fact, I think some churches uh, believe that the church has replaced Israel in terms of Israel's blessings and that they no longer, that those churches no longer recognize Israel, the nation, as God's chosen. Uh, our church does not do that. We continue to believe Israel is God's chosen nation. But the enlargement of the context of the word Israel to include believers is a concept which uh, is believed by many. Okay. How are you doing? Are you, am I doing okay? You keeping up? And got, anybody got any questions? Boy. Okay, so let's go to the start of the church. Um, the use of the word church there is prolific. There are 80 references to the word church and 35 to churches. Sometimes the word church is used to speak of a local, local church and churches to speak of a specific set of churches in that context. However, sometimes the word church is used to speak of the church of God and of course his church is many times referred to appropriately as the body of Christ. And Christ refers to it as his body. Church is mentioned in only one gospel, interestingly enough, of all these references um, in the New Testament. It's only in one gospel, and that's in the book of Matthew. And there are three references, and they're all uh, a word spoken by Jesus. They're in two verses, Matthew 16, uh, 18 and 18, 17. Now the book of Acts has 22 references. Appropriate is, of course, that book is talking about the Holy Spirit ministering through the apostles and that's, that's a really active time for the uh, young church. So now, well, I, now I've, I've, I've um, shown my hand, but I've got four different theologies that I found that uh, are as to when the church started. There's what's called the covenant theology, which believes the church began in the Old Testament with the covenant with Abraham. And, um, we know that Abraham was counted as a believer because uh, he had righteous, because of his righteousness. Okay. And then there's a second theology. The church began with John the Baptist simply because he was the first to baptize and baptism is a distinguishing feature of the church. Uh, however, we know from reading scripture we did, I think, some of this last time, but John's baptism did not include baptism by the Spirit because at that time Christ was uh, on, on earth and the Spirit hadn't come. The third theology is the church began on the day of Pentecost and consists of all believers up, and to, up to and through the present age. And the fourth as the church began during the ministry of the Apostle Paul during his first missionary journey or during his confinement in Rome, and there are some references given in Acts. Most theologians and, and this reader, I believe that the church began on the day of Pentecost, and there are several reasons uh, why uh, that's the case. Christ's words identifying he will build it from Matthew 16, 18, 
And he said, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So that's one of the references that I gave you where Christ spoke about, specifically about the word, about the church. And of course, the Catholics believe that it was, Peter was the rock on which the church would be built. The Christian theologians believe Christ is the rock. And the gates of hell, there are a couple of ways to interpret that. Uh, one is that people think that this should be interpreted as though the gates of hell are attacking, but they aren't. The gates of hell are, fi are, are fixed. Gates are fixed. And so the church uh, should be attacking the gates of hell, which really signify death. And um, another interpretation is that that Christ himself uh, prevailed against death. Okay, second uh, reason, the resurrection and ascension of Christ are essential to the functioning of the church. Here we look at Ephesians chapter one, verses 19 through 22. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he, of course, God, raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians 4, 7 through 12 complements this. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work, work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. And there we are again with a church called by another name. Thirdly, the evidence that the church began on the day of Pentecost is that of the baptizing work of the Holy Spirit. Christ declared in Acts 1, 5 that this particular ministry of the Spirit was still future. What is it that the spirit of baptism does? And I gave you a couple of verses to look at to answer that. So I'm going to pause here to catch my breath and give you a chance to talk. Well, I had some questions about that. Uh, I think there are other verses like Acts 1, 5 and, and Luke 3 that kind of refer to that, and I made some notes about it, but is baptism of the Holy Spirit something that happens? It looks like in, in Paul in 1 Corinthians that he's talking about something that happens when one accepts Christ and is baptized. What, what this in Acts Luke is talking about something that happened later after people were baptized. Um, what uh, one definition of what happens with baptism with the Holy Spirit is that you will receive extraordinary power for Christ exhausting his ministry. 
And um, one author I read talked about whether you, John Piper, talked about whether you can be baptized in the spirit more than once. Maybe you're baptized in the spirit when you accept Christ, but then there are other times that you become overpowered with the spirit. And he gave some references to places in Bible, like when Paul was on Cyprus and uh, on, in his first missionary journey, and he was overcome by the Holy Spirit and witnessed to the uh, person there. And does that tell me, I want somebody else's comments on that. Louise, you're doing fine. Those are all good questions. Um, when, when you accept Christ with the full knowledge of what you're doing, in other words, you accept him for who he is and you accept him as Lord in your life. At that time, the spirit comes and indwells in you. That doesn't have anything to do with bapt the formal baptism part in the water, as I understand it. Now, it turns out when Christ was baptized, it, it looks like the two go together. But, the, but it, I think if you uh, think through and, and watch how Pastor Barry does a baptism service at the church, it's a matter of that process is to uh, be a testimony to those in the church, your brothers and sisters in Christ, that you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. Anyone else have any comments on that? The other, for, I want to pause again, but the other question you raise about, um, I think, border on can you lose the spirit and have it come back? Uh, can there be uh, infillings? Can you quench the spirit? I, that's not a word you use, but the answer to that is yes, you can. So, um, Timothy, uh, Timothy, Stephen, when he was stoned, he was really, really, really filled with the Spirit. It's pretty clear from the way Acts reads. Does that help? And, and does anyone have any other comments? It goes along with, with what Piper said about it. Um, pretty much. You know, yeah, there, there are times, I mean, when, I, when I'm when um, i doing what I shouldn't be doing, when I'm angry and it's not righteous anger, I know I'm quenching the spirit and I, and I it, sometimes it might take me a couple hours, but I eventually come back and I'm, I'm, uh, I know full well what I've done. I wish it only took me a couple of hours. <laughs> sometimes it takes longer. I was trying to. <laughs> uh, Rex, I think if we read Matthew 28 from 16 to... 20, uh, the Great Commission, then, it's, um, then the 11 disciples went away to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed uh, for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, uh, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that have commanded you. 
and lo, I am with you all, always, even to the very end of the age. Mm -hmm. And that deals that deals with the the baptism of the Spirit, the the formal the formal process, but the the actual in, indwelling of the Spirit is based on a personal decision and mm -hmm. and conviction by the spirit yeah and and it and it is true that when the when pastor Barry does his baptismal service he baptizes in the name of the father son and holy spirit and that's a, another reference as we had earlier to the triune God. Any good comment, uh, Adam? Any I comment? looked at this a couple years ago, uh, and basically there is the filling with the Holy Spirit and the, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit are two different things. Baptism of the, of the Spirit happens once. Filling with the, with the Holy Spirit can happen several times. And there's a couple of scriptures you can look at for that. Uh, let's see. I'm looking at some of my notes. It's, yeah, the Spirit's baptism occurs once for each believer at the moment of salvation, but the filling happens at different times. Uh, let's see if I can have pick up some things here. Uh, Acts uh, eleven fifteen, and as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as He did upon us at the beginning. Uh, do, let's see, Romans six three, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into His death? Uh, let's see, and so then, oh, and then Acts four eight. Then Peter, Peter, filled with the Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people. So that's filling and baptism. On that study that I did, are a couple different things. Interesting, John. That's that, go ahead, Louise. I, I just was saying it's interesting. Thank you, um, uh, Don. That the, I, I that is interesting my but the spirit is is always with us once we're baptized by the spirit the spirit's always with us so the filling would imply that we may have more receptivity to the spirit at some times than other times and in, in the times we're really receptive and or when the spirit really wants to have an impact on us he really puts the pressure on us. yep Okay. Um, okay. I, I'd like to come back to, to this last verse that I have here because it, to me, it, it carries another message dealing with the spirit and should have talked more about it when we talked about the spirit, but, but now's a good time as any. It's in, in again, John 14, uh, verses 25 and 26. And it's 26, the verse 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, what's he going to do? He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, we weren't there when Christ was there. But we have the scripture. We have the Holy Scripture. And in order for the Spirit to bring to remembrance all that that scripture has said to us, we need to be in it. Okay? And so it behooves, I think, each of us to spend more time reading the Word and seeking the Spirit to guide us in understanding it and applying it. Okay. Hey, we're halfway. Any any questions on the on this section? Start of the church.
Next section is the mission of the church. And as I indicated, there are lots of ways to look at this. But the primary charge, of course, is, as Adams has noted, is the Great Commission. However, there's much more instruction given in the, in the scripture for the church. And I noted a Ryrie, uh, which is a book that Crean happened to have in her library, Survey of Bible Doctrine lists many important elements with scriptural references. Local church should always show its love for the Lord. The church should minister to its own members so they incite one another to love and good works. So they're, the church members minister to each other. The gospel should be preached in the services of the church so that when unbelievers come in, they can hear it. And all the epistles bear testimony to the teaching ministry of the local congregation. The church is to care for its own. It started, of course, in Acts with the widows um, but also the orphans and the poor. The church is to do good in the world. Carrying out a mission, the church may sometimes discipline in the realm of morals and maintenance of purity and doctrine. Have any of you ever been in a church where there was a disciplinary action taken? Yes. Mm. Yep. I was not a member of the church, but I'm well aware of. Yeah, we, with it's all not the, fun. With all the different churches we've been in, we've had that experience in only one, one occasion. Paul in his letters often refers to faith that early believers exhibited. Um, and I, I've noted here a couple of couple of verses. But boy, I found a ton of them. Um, Romans, Paul saying, "Your faith is proclaimed in all the world." Wow. Thessalonians, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and into Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. Uh, David Jeremiah in his book that I've been using for a reference for some of my materials, speaks to how the early church was on fire and how Christianity spread from Jerusalem through the then known world, Middle East, Asia, Europe, and even Africa. And he gives a whole bunch of references uh, about this. And um, he has, a in Jeremiah's book, he has uh, taken the verses out where it shows all the numbers, how they increased you know, there were like 3,000 just on the day of Pentecost. Um, are our churches on fire like that today? Nope. Some may be, but... What's that? Some may be, but most aren't. Well, if we talk about the universal church, I would say that uh, the universal church is not on fire like that. Hmm. Uh, some local churches may be. Some of the some of the younger churches when they first start up, they tend to tend to grow like like fire. Um, I know the church we were in before we came to Redmond was um, uh, had a very large older congregation, and uh, uh, it was a good church. 
carrying church, but I wouldn't say it was on fire. And then uh, change in pastor, and they have a young pastor now, and they've been growing very well, very rapidly. I think we can say that Twin Rivers is growing yeah. pretty rapidly. Yes. Yeah. And I think our church, I think Highland is, uh, relatively speaking at least, on fire with been reaching people. Yeah. One, one element that is part of the Great Commission and was clearly evident in the early church is worldwide evangelism, today called missions in most churches. Most of this outreach is done by proxy, that is, we send money supporting missionaries. Uh, sometimes we know them. Uh, in the case of our church, we tithe. I think regularly and the money goes to the Southern Baptist Mission Organization. And so we don't get to really have a lot of any, any or if any, we, it's limited contact with any of the missionaries. Uh, I, I would argue with that. I think we have contact uh, with our missionaries. They come in and speak when they can, right? The last year we can't because the mission board has told them not to be going out and speaking when, when they're in the States. But we've had, we've had a, a, one big conference where we had several of them. And we have a committee that is in, and you may not know this, but there is a committee that keeps in touch with several of our missionaries. Uh, and they send us news about what they're doing at least monthly and usually about every two weeks. I, uh, I, thank you, Louise. I wasn't saying that I use the term limited in the sense only that I don't know how many missionaries a Southern Baptist organization has, but it's huge. And so yeah. at best, we can only touch a limited number. But I do know yeah. what you say, our church reaches out, does have them as much as they can be available. And then in addition, our church has a separate mission activity uh, where we have people who go. And uh, 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 we haven't been on any of those trips, but I know a number of the younger people in our church have. And we're not, we didn't have any last year and we won't have any. Right now, there are no trips planned for this year because of COVID. Nobody knows what would happen when we got there. Nobody knows what travel arrangements yeah. would have to be made and all that. Uh, Adams, you're involved in with uh, Be the Salt Africa um, uh, organization that you and Katie have started. But your church there in uh, Athy, is it in Athy River? Yeah, just close by, uh, around three miles away. And uh, uh, your pastor and his wife and five, what are they elders or at least uh, uh, yeah. went, went up to Tana River to uh, mm -hmm. meet with the elders uh, and the community there, this Muslim community that you're ministering to uh, a couple weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, how large is your Ethy River Church? Just yes, around uh, 50 members. It's not big, it's a small church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you for sharing that. Mm. Okay. Louise has been on missionary trips. Well, Louise, you've been on missionary trips. Uh, not any of the big ones to foreign countries. But uh, I've been to Nashville, some of the ones in the States I've been okay. on. Good. I'm, missions is sort of one of the things that I, one of my pets. Yeah, well, yeah, that, that's mine too. And uh, uh, I even got Corrine to go to Africa with me once. Me too. I wanted to go to Nigeria and I had a Nigerian <laughs> Um, or pen pal when I was in high school. 
Wow. Yeah, Nigeria I've not been to, but Nigeria's uh, would be a challenge, I think. Okay, structure of the church. Christ is the head of the church, which is referred to as the body. Um, Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And then, of course, sometimes I think we think of the church as an organization, but it, it really is a body. And 1 Corinthians, Paul uh, used the analogy of the human body. And so uh, I, I uh, gave you uh, a little bit of homework besides all the reading. So the same Holy Spirit is at work in all believers in the church transcends ethnic and social differences. What, what verse did you have for that? Uh, verse 13. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everybody. Okay. Paul used the figure of the human body with its many different members with this basic unity to illustrate the body of Christ. How about that verse? 14. 14. Each member of the body is a part of the body and belongs in the body couple of verses there. 15 to 17. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 12, 20 is one of them. 20. 12, 14. Yeah. And 14. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, the church is the body of Christ. 27. God has placed each member in the body according to his plan. Oh, Second part of 24. 24. I think the I second heard. Part of it. Yeah. Eighteen green saying, I think. Yeah. When one member suffers, the whole body is involved. Members should so show concern for one another. Six. 26. Mm -hmm. You know, we could, well, we could spend a lot of time on the, on the church. Um, but because there's so much, there's a lot of instruction uh, given for the local church organization in Paul's letters. Uh, we know in the book of Acts, that's a reference to the first deacons. And does anybody know who the first elders, what church was that? I'm sorry. What? Which church had the first elders? Um. Philippi had elders and bishops. Well, but there were elders. Weren't there elders in Jerusalem? Yes. First church was Jerusalem. Yeah. And the elders in the church was led by. Jesus, Jesus, brother James, right? Uh, mm. Homework. Okay. In, in addressing the church age, there's implied by that title an end point. And um, we've talked a little bit about some of that last time when we uh, introduced the term rapture. But as a, as a forerunner for that discussion, I want you to note something about the, um, the use of the word church in the New Testament. I said there, there are a ton of references. And um, it, it ranged from Jesus' words in Matthew 
last, the very last time church, the word church is used, it's churches actually, is in the last chapter of the book of Revelation 22. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. Hmm. The whole book of Revelation is for John to write these things because Jesus is testifying to him for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. If we look at the book of Revelation, there are, the word church is used in the first three chapters. And those of you who've read the book know that there are seven churches described in those first three chapters. But the word church is not used again until the last chapter. And in between is all the description of the great tribulation and the wedding with the saints. But even in that latter part, the word church is, is, is not used. It's just the congregation of all the saints. Okay. Any comments or questions? Back to missions. Uh, I didn't mean to be argumentative but I was thinking that what you meant was many churches, missionaries come because they have to come to the churches to get oh. financial aid to go to other countries. Mm -hmm. And we don't do that, but uh, according to uh, David Cooper and other people that I've known, uh, the way we handle missions, our missionaries have enough that they give to other missionaries on the field. And when they come to our church, they're not coming to get us to give money. Of course, they want us to give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and, yep. and those things, yep. but they don't depend on coming to us for money. They have, uh, David was talking about how nice the facilities are that he's gonna be going to for their training. And they have, you know, really, really nice yep nice stuff and are doing really well louise you know, no i'm i did not m misunderstand your your comments and pr i appreciated them we have been this is the first church we have been in that has a uh giving model which is southern baptist uh based and we really appreciate it because um so many other missionaries that we have dealt with and the churches that we've been in have in fact been uh, the church, the, the missionaries have to come to the churches and ask for support. And of course they never get full support from one church as a rule. So they're, they have multiple churches that are in their uh, donor base, support base, and they, they spend a great deal of time uh, uh, blatantly using the term fundraising uh, rather than ministering. Now, it, they do minister when they visit those churches, but still they um, th they have a real need, which is to raise funds. And um, so we've seen, we've seen both sides of that. And we really like the Southern Baptist model. Now, having said that, I've seen a couple churches which, um, have committed their their that uh, they have made commitments to missions, which is really uh, unique. Um, church we were in in Minneapolis, Gracie Dinah, basically had a once a year offering for missions. The church had when we were there probably twenty five hundred members and they had a budget over a million dollars. That's over 20 years ago. Um, that church uh, was greatly blessed by God. It was a growing church, continues to this day. It's a growing church. And their mission program is 
is absolutely fantastic. But it's a big, big church. Another one that's in the same category, which by the way is a Southern Baptist church, is David Jeremiah's church in El Cajon. And uh, they, they have a percentage base that they give uh, to missions. And it's, I'm not sure what it is now. It used to be, I think, 15%. Um, but they have a huge, a huge mission budget. And they support, uh, I'm sure they, they provide support to Southern Baptist missions, but they also have a large number of missionaries that they support. But I, yeah, we really, we like this model. It's a good one. Any, any other comments? You know, uh, it's it's only seven seventeen. How did we do that? Probably because page eight was blank, Rex. <laughs> page eight was blank. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, you're right. Oh, well, I know why. I left that for all the notes that you were going to take. <laughs> all right. So um, we should go around see if anyone has any prayer requests. Cliff, how, any more news? Cliff's talking to you. He's walking around right now to stretch. Rex asked you if you had any more news. Yeah. Any any more news? Anything on your well, I'm doctor appointments and so on? Three quarters of the way through the dermatology stuff. One more treatment on my face. That'll be done. Thank, thank the Lord for that. And my hip is just taking its time. And he's doing yoga. <laughs> so yeah, we've started a pretty active yoga program to help stretch all that stuff out. So that's worked well. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a friend who's into this yoga thing and he keeps telling me that I need to, I need to do some of that. You need to talk to Rex Cliff. I, I've only fought it for 70 <laughs> years, you know. <laughs> I finally succumbed. And uh, it's, so far it's, it's worked well. Ah, okay. Good to know. Yeah, I went out for a walk this afternoon. I tried to get in about 5,000 steps in a day, and I, I came home, my back was bothering me. Ah. But that's a 24-7 issue. Yeah. Okay. Any Anything else anyone has? Uh, there was someone on the 12th prayer list Walt and Myrna, I don't know who they are, but she had open heart surgery today. Mm. And uh, I don't know if anybody knows them. Let me see if I've is got this, anything. Is this someone in the church? I'm just yeah. looking to see that, or if it's just, a, I assumed that it was, but it may be somebody that just asked for prayer. Did, our prayer list didn't give last names for confidentiality purposes and so yeah, to figure out sometime. Well, I'm looking, I'm looking at the church prayer request. Walt reported that Myrna's surgery went well. She's in ICU and they are letting her wake up naturally. He's thankful for everyone's prayers. So we can be praying for her recovery, it would appear. Everything went well. Okay, any, anything else? Okay. Yeah, um, our girl Eliza is sick. She has tonsils, so she has medication, but uh, she's having a hard time. Uh, I'm sorry, who is this, Adams? I, Eliza, Eliza is, is, is not feeling well. Who's Eliza? 
That's my data. Eliza. Okay, I got it. I got it now. Sorry, between my ears and the sound system, I'm not getting everything. Uh, but Eliza, uh, your daughter, she's not sleeping well. She, she got a bug or? She, she's, uh, she has a tonsils uh, um, uh, infection, so she got medication, but um, she's having a hard time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we can be in prayer for her. Katie doing okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Rick, let's, yes. I found, uh, we have a Walter and Myrna Deardorf in our church. So that's probably. That must be who it is. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, how about if I close in some prayer and, and then we'll look toward uh, next time. Father God, we uh, thank you for everyone here tonight, and we continue to lift up Cliff to you and as he's undergoing treatments, and um, both for his back and for his uh, issues on his face. Father, uh, thank you for uh, the, the blessings of the treatments that he's had today, and we continue to pray, Father, for his uh, recovery. And Lord, we pray for Murma. Myrna and her recovery from surgery. We ask uh, and give thanks for the, phys the physicians who did the surgery and uh, praise you that she is now uh, in the state of recovery and ask for your healing hand. And Lord, we pray for Elijah um, that she uh, can get through this infection that she's having and get back to her uh, energetic uh, young self. Lord, thank you for Adams and Katie and their family. Lord, we praise you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the discussions we've had tonight as we have strived to uh, learn more and to be guided by uh, your wisdom in that regard. Lord, we give all the praise and thanks to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.